Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, the last presentation is going to be very, very interesting. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Niklas Piron, who is another longtime contrib contributor of Nixos. I think it's also been working on the project for at least seven or eight years. Uh, Niklas is a professional compiler engineer, and uh, his, the most significant contribution to Nixos is probably the module system that we all enjoy these days. So when we write a configuration.nix, the mechanism that actually turns this into something that runs is uh, his invention and original design. And today he's going to be talking about uh, a novel way of shipping security updates. So enjoy your presentation. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so I have a bit of a problem with my presentation. Uh, I realized that after repeating too many times, I kind of shorten it and shorten it and shorten it. So I found a solution, which is I will do something during the introduction to speak how I accidentally shortened my presentation by repeating it. So we are going to talk about shipping security updates. One of the first thing I want to show you is security update matters. And I have a few links, so unfortunately, uh, the ones that you can find in my slides that I just mentioned on Twitter are kind of a bit off because they decided to put the page to a 40 or four, uh, four, uh, four or four uh, just today. Who knows? So, uh, they have a new presentation, but I will probably show you the old one because the old one is sorted by dates, which is not the case of this one. So uh, let me bring the old one. So I looked for Debian, not because, uh, yeah, Debian is known for uh, having lots, caring about security issues more than anybody else. So. I looked for Debian. And I found some few interesting things. So we use unzip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Severity 4. Eh, okay. Uh, we use WordPress. Okay. Uh, that probably same class of bugs. Uh, unzip, unzip, WordPress. <laughs> Next page. <laughs> so, PHP. We use PHP. <laughs> I hear some people complaining about using it. <laughs> so, okay, PHP. GDK Pix Buff. Oh, this one we use it in Firefox, I, if I remember. Oh, Mini UPNC. <laughs> okay. So MariaDB, OpenGDK, uh, VirtualBox, we use VirtualBox. <laughs> and, okay, and if I remember correctly, uh, on other pages you have like Firefox and others because we're making releases and Stuff like that. So the user link is a link to uh, the US website with uh, the CV uh, enumerations uh, for enumerating <laughs> bugs which are reported and with which have security flows. Oh, here it is, Firefox. So if we look at the bugs from last week, or the, yeah, last week, so we use Ad, Acrobat Reader. <laughs> okay. Uh, I won't ask about Cisco stuff. Uh, we use Android. <laughs> and Firefox. Okay, so that's my point. <laughs> we can get back to the presentation. Okay. So basically, there are lots of security issues in the wild, and you are probably using software which has security issues. So, can we trust? Uh, can we trust this software? Depends what we define by trust. I cannot trust myself for not making any bugs. 
uh, that's a problem because I'm also developing in Firefox. And I kind of had lots of bugs. Hopefully, we have a good uh, security team which has a fuzz, which use fuzzing on Firefox to make sure that we don't ship any of this bug to the users. Mm, sometimes it happens, but hopefully not too frequently. So the question is, how do we define trust knowing that all softwares have bugs? Mostly. So in terms of, shi of shipping security updates, we can view tr the trust relation as do the software developers and, release, uh, and the person who release it care about you? Uh, do they fix it? Do they ship it? Do they ship the security updates? And do you get it? So do they care about you, basically? And to show that, I will take a few examples that we saw in the list previously. Not NixOS, not yet. Uh, we will see Android, which is like uh, well known and developed and released by different people. And we will see Firefox also, uh, which uh, is developed by Mozilla and released by Mozilla as well, but also by Linux distribution, such as NixOS. So, first, I will uh, talk about this. I will talk about this graph. This graph is uh, how to explain it clearly. This is how the API, uh, the versions of the API of Android in the wild. So, as of today, we have like less than 10 percent of uh, 5.1, and this version of API are mapped to uh, the version numbers of Android. Uh, what this graph does not show are the dot releases, which are corresponding to the security fixes which are applied. So first, we will not look at this graph, but only at the 0% line. The 0% line is basically what Google developers are doing, or Android developers, to be more general, which is like, uh, you see that they are making releases at quite a nice pace, which is kind of good. The other interesting point is that they are not making dot releases after they made a new uh, minor release. So as soon as they made 4.4, they are not making any dot releases for 4.3, which is kind of a problem if you don't update your phone. So just looking at the bottom of the graph, I guess we can trust Android developers for making frequent releases to users. But there is another part of this graph which shows us what people are using effectively. And this is not Google. This is like your phone carrier or uh, phone, uh, phone uh, manufacturer or network operator. They are shipping, they are selling user phones. And the problem is that it costs them money to get a phone validated to work on the network, and they don't care enough to pay for uh, getting new updates to, you, uh, to the users. So basically, as it costs money, they don't want to ship new version, and that's why you end up with like a bit near 80% of users which are running versions which are unlikely to be updated anymore. Hey, Uber 300 users? <laughs> hmm? Yes, yeah, so this diagram is updated as probably every, or. Okay, I don't know all the details about Android, and I took this diagram from the Wikipedia page about the story of, the story of Android versions. So this diagram shows us two things. You can have developers who cares about users, but if it's not released, that's a big problem. So let's look at Firefox. Whoa, <laughs> that's way, that's a lot of releases. And by the way, if you see the 18.0.1, hey, I've made a patch over there. Uh, <laughs> kind of my fault. Sometimes things go in releases, and who knows? So, 
one of the interesting things about Firefox is not uh, that much that they are making a lot of releases. Ah, oh, it is. Uh, it's so okay. Rewind. Firefox is making a lot of releases. We can see that they seem to care a lot about their users. That sounds like a good news. <laughs> and one of the questions we might ask is, how do they do that? How do they ship that many releases? Like, if we look between 2013 and 2014, we see that they have roughly between they have 10 major releases and about 20 uh, patch releases. That's kind of a lot of releases, like more than months. So we might wonder how they do that. And the, one of the things that you have to remember when you are making such updates is that you don't want something which involves stress. Because when this involves stress, you are making mistakes, like typos and copy and paste errors, which apparently somebody caught in my slides. So you want a process for making releases. You want to make sure that if you have to ship a security issue, then it will follow some things that you are sure to, to not make any mistakes because that's something that written down step one, step two, step three. So for Firefox, we have a process which we call can spill for chemical spillage. Uh, which is kind of the vocabulary that we have inside Mozilla. And the goal is to make sure that we do the things right. So if we look at what this looks like from the time, uh, so before this graph, we have like some developers making sure that they have the right fixes in time and checking that these are working. And then this goes into the build farms that we have, which ensures that as soon as we build, we know the time frame and we know what to do. So if we look at this graph, we have a few, we have at the beginning, okay, we received the information that we want to build it and we tagged it. And then we do the Linux build, we pack it with the language pack because we need internationalization as opposed to NixOS so far. And then, a few hours after, we are able to ship Android versions to uh, Android and Linux version to uh, our users. So, as a distribution, that's where you want to start shipping uh, versions of Firefox. But Firefox is on, only on Linux, so we have a long process which goes and goes and goes, where we have QA to make sure that this works on uh, Windows and which works correctly. And then we ship it to all our users, uh, which are mostly Windows users so far. So that's about a day. But for us, it's about four hours after as a Linux distribution. So now let's look at how we do that in NixOS or Nix packages. So we have multiple ways of doing it. We have the solution of uh, you can wait until uh, until everything got rebuilt, in which case you can wait a long time, depending on what's not building anymore. Or you can have a solution of taking a small channel of a few packages, but then uh, in the case of Firefox, you probably have to recompile it yourself, and if there is something broken in the middle, you will probably not be able to recompile it yourself, and you will end up with still the old version of Firefox, which has a security issue. So to fix that, we kind of introduced like, okay, if that's mostly for libraries, if that's all, uh, if you have a library which is not fire, this does not apply for Firefox, but mostly for libraries. If you have libraries which uh, is wrong as an issue, then we have a, f a function in uh, packages replace deplacement, uh, replace dependencies, and which has an XFS option equivalent for uh, doing that, which goes through, okay, you have a clo you have a closure of, or you have a package, a user environment, or uh, your Linux distribution uh, derivation, and you want to go through and replace one child by another and say, oh, it's fixed. So let's take an example. Imagine you're, you have your boss 
in Asia for some reason, and it calls you at 3 a.m. in the morning and tells you, okay, I heard that we have an open SSL issue. Can, is our system uh, safe? And then you go on the computer, you, go, you check, okay, Nixos Nix Wiki, and then you read, okay, dear user, please proceed as follow. So you create a module and you put this stuff and you include that in all your configuration. What can be wrong? I, I, I'm asking you, any guesses? Hmm? Only headers? Yeah, with multiple outputs, that can be a solution. <laughs> That's another solution. The wiki was updated by the hacker. <laughs> static linking. Or any package that statically links it can solve it necessarily. Yeah, this solution does not solve the problem of static linking. But I have another one for you. It's 3 a.m. in the morning, and you just copy and paste this stuff and didn't realize that as a Vim user, you confuse the L and the H. And while you were typing the original equal OpenSSH, you made a mistake of locking yourself out of all the computers that you are updating while keeping a security issue in OpenSSL. <laughs> yeah, Vim users. <laughs> so, you don't want users to indulge themselves security issues. So, the current models that we have requires the user awareness, like update this channel or do this crazy manipulation. And there are some tricky things about ABI compatibilities that the user is not necessarily aware of. And that's still an exception. That's not part of the normal deployment. So what are the solution? Eh, you can wait. You know what can happen after a month, you will get an update. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> you probably know this logo. This logo is the early logo from the OpenSSL issue. And what surprised me about this logo is that they got a logo. It took us a year for the next, a bit more than a year, and two or three, I can't remember, to get the first logo that we recently replaced. And in a few days, they got a logo. What, what is this world in which we are living where security issues are getting a logo? <laughs> so <laughs> let's see how we can fix that. So currently, replace dependency is one of the nicest ways that we have to uh, update uh, for security issues because it does not involve uh, recompiling everything. It only involves recompiling the ones that you have a fix for. So the problem that we have today is that it's maintained by, and we don't want any user interaction. One of the other problems is that the way it does today is like, it makes sure that you have all the packages and look for the runtime dependencies in, hey, you have to compile them. And <laughs> look for the runtime dependencies and then check, okay, is there this runtime dependency? Okay, replace it by this one. So this means that you have to compile everything before knowing that you want to update it. Which can be kind of problematic if you're just wondering if you have a different one. You just want to check, okay, do I get the same derivation? Oh, no, I get a new system to compile. <laughs> so, and there is also the problems that Elko mentioned about the fact that we still have issue about static linking. But that's something that we can handle in some way. And that's a line that if I do that, it disappears. <laughs> so we will address in the rest of this presentation a way that I started to make in a pull request to make sure that security updates are transparent for the users. That they are fast, which means that Hydra only has to build one thing and one and make it the first thing that it has to build. And that also it's easy for you, pack uh, we're packaging software to make sure that, okay, I know what is an ABI, I know that this is an ABI compatible change, so let's, do, uh, let's update it this way. And sane in the sense that we don't look at runtime dependencies to know if, it, if we should update or not. 
So by transparent, what I mean is that if you were to do the first two lines, then you should do the next two lines. Yeah, it's the same. Ideally, you should not do anything. <laughs> so that's how Firefox is working. You don't, hey, updated, you got a new version. <laughs> but no user action at all. But that's the ideal world, and we can leave that for later. So what does that imply? That implies that we have next packages as of today, which is a fixed point with a, pack, a list of package where we have a package A, a package B, which depends on A, and a package C, which depends on B. So if we want C, we have to pull B and A. And so in terms of implications, this implies that we have to have the same layout as next packages. So as a start, we will take next packages as our solution. So that's transparent. But we want to be to have it fast and to avoid uh, recompilation. So that's one of the solution, which is a bit more complex. So let's look a bit at it. We have A and C, which are fixed version. So I have a fixes for A. So I have a, I can recompile A. Oh. I don't need the arrow from A to A. That's a detail. Uh, no, I need. Yeah, I need an arrow from the dependencies of A to a, uh, the blue A. Whatever. You you can do this transformation in your head and hope that it will rip. <laughs> okay. So we have a fixed version of A, which re which is recompiled not against the new version, the fixed packages, but against the old packages, the brown one. Same thing for C. So what is this B? The, the green B. This B is a version of B where we compile it not, uh, we don't, sorry, we don't compile it we take the ones that we had before in next packages, the brown one, and instead of recompiling it, we apply the, we apply the change that we change the old A, the brown A, by the blue A. So the green B is replacing the brown A by the blue A inside B. We don't know if it's used. We know that it's a compile time dependency, and we know that we might be able, we might do that. So this is how it looks like. You have a first version that you already know, that's your stable channel, where you have everything brown. You don't know if it's stable or not. Then you have another version where you have fixes for each of the, each of the packages which had issues. And then what you do is basically the same idea as replace dependencies, which is fix everything which is down the chain with patching one, and by replacing one dependency by the other. Okay, uh, keep that in mind, or if you don't want to do it, I can do that for you. And we are back to the presentation. Yep, we're back to the presentation. So, you, you saw the fixed point before, right? You, you all understand how it works. So. A fixed point is that if I get this next packages, basically it loops into itself until I get one thing. So you can see it as a for loop, which only exists as soon as you are able to see the same result twice. So let's go a bit deeper. So we have a fixed point. If I call f, or if I call it twice, I will still get a fixed point because I will get the same result. So, one more step. If I have a fixed point on next packages, I will get a full set of next packages, and if I apply next packages a second time after, I still get the same set of next packages. Because applying next packages once until I get a, a fixed point means that I don't have any more changes, and if I apply it one more time, I don't get any more changes because I had a fixed point. So the trick is 
if you want to recompile only the software which got patched with, issue, with uh, fixes for security issues or others, you just take another Nix packages with the fixes and you apply it after. So, hey, you only recompile the packages that you have fixes for. And all the others will recompile the same way. So, that does not give us the green one. We have all the blue one, but we don't have the green one. If you apply it one more time, then you got in a tricky position, where you have some which are recompiled once uh, with the fixes, you have some which are recompiled with uh, the fixed version, but at the end you still recompile, which is what, oh, gradient. Which is kind of bad when our goal is to be fast. So we don't want recompilation, so we don't want this red one, which implies that we will recompile with everything. But this red one has an information that we want. The information that we want is that, hey, something changed. So here is the tricky part. What we are doing to get the fixes right, to make sure that we are patching, is we ask, hey, what happens if you do one more step? Do you recompile or you don't? Basically, packages that we have today are like stdenv blob. Okay, I have no idea what's in this blob. I have no idea if that's an input, if that's uh, something which is used for fetching the sources. No clues. So the only way we have today to make sure that we know if something has to recompile or not is to, hey, does it, is the output different or not? So basically what this one is doing, it's doing, hey, uh, I have the quick fixes in one side, I have the one which are doing one more step, do I get the same output? If you don't get the same output, that means that the one which has one more step is being recompiled with one of its input. So if you take the list of inputs of both packages and you look for the differences, you will surely find one difference. And then you apply the difference to your result, uh, to the result of the ones that are in the blue part. And you know what? You're fixing. You are basically replacing some uh, so, uh, something with you are replacing the brown one with the blue one in the green one. Okay. <laughs> People are might be lost. <laughs> so what this is doing is basically asking, hey, do you recompile? Yes. Check the input. You check the input, you map them one to one, and you know which dependency inside the inputs of your uh Deep inside the inputs that you give to uh, your expression, you have to replace inside the, the current inputs that you get. So basically you get the same as replace dependency, except that you have it at compile time instead of at, uh, with the runtime dependency, which makes it sane and fast, because you only recompile the quick fixes and you get to patch all others which are depending on them. Everybody's okay? Okay, so now let's look how easy it is. That's simple as the first two. You get the old one, hey, stable branch. You get stable packages in one place, and you get a few fixes over there. So instead of shipping one version, which is a stable branch, you just ship two, <laughs> two versions of next packages. Not a big deal. We can do that and call that the security channel and merge, and that's all. <laughs> We're good. So what happens in terms of release management? So as a packager, you want to know, okay, uh, what do I do as a package manager knows that we solve the user case? That's quite simple. You know when something is compatible in terms of ABI. Oh, it's either in the version number or either it's contradicted by the changelog. Uh, when it's not in the version number. And 
basically, you know, okay, this is a fix, which might be a security fix. So let's say in GitHub, you annotate your uh, pushes to master and say, oh, security fix. Then somebody will run your patch and say, okay, this is a security fix. I need to go to uh, the security branch, uh, to the ABI compatible branch and cherry pick this one. So you have one model, which is like you have a branch, a master branch, and you have an ABI compatible branch, which starts every time we have a new channel and which cherry pick every changes that you have. So then you can wonder, okay, what is, how do we handle this ABI branch, this ABI compatible branch? You have multiple solutions also. You can either merge master into it, which has some nice property of keeping the ones which are not there already, or you can reset the branch and start it again. That's something which is up to debate, and I'm not in the right position to ask that. Maybe domain. So, if you have other ideas, feel free to contribute. And unfortunately, this model does not solve all the problem. It solves like a big chunk of sanity and making sure that you get transparent updates in, for users, which is like, hey, open SSH. Oh, oops. <laughs> uh, and this requires also some. Uh, instrumentation if we want to get it optimal. Uh, like, okay, we're doing that with the compile time dependencies, but if there is a GCC update, okay, you probably want to have the compile time dependencies there. Uh, let's take another example. If there is a bash update, uh, okay, if there is a bash update, not and your program does not necessarily depend on bash. And if it does, you want to update it. If it doesn't, then you're going to patch something with something which will, with an expression which will say, okay, take the old hash of bash, take the new hash of bash and replace it in something where there is no occurrences of it. So that's kind of pointless. So one way of doing, of optimizing that, and I'm saying optimizing because this is the same version and we, we don't necessarily want to patch things with no op. So, a way of optimizing that is when Hydra builds uh, Nix packages, we can say, hey, I scanned the build after uh, building it, which <laughs> is, by the way, already done by the gar uh, for the garbage collector. So you can get all the dependencies that you have at runtime and say, oh, you had a list of inputs. Among the list of inputs that you have, here is how they are mapped in the binary. So basically, you can shrink that to the list of runtime dependencies. And then you get an optimization, which is, oh, don't have to look at every, uh, every argument of my Nix expression for my package. But this has a downside of not giving you the same shell, because if you were to patch once, you might get the same content but you had one more derivation to do. One more, fix, one more thing for NITS 3.0. <laughs> so, and of course you don't have uh, static library support, which is another issue for in terms of security, which is like annotating, hey, you depend on this statically. But that's another issue. And that's the end of my talk. Yeah, I have to admit I didn't quite understand the whole fixed point stuff. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> can you sort of explain, what, for instance, in terms of the open SSL uh, example, what would this mean concretely uh, for uh, the package maintainer? So what, what does uh, he or she uh, commit to, say, the security branch or the master branch? And what does Hydra do? Okay. So how is it magically going to prevent recompilation? So... I, I will take it as like there is a packager got the information that there is a new OpenSSL fix uh, in addition to the fact that we heard about the issue before 
And so you have a patch. You have a patch which switch OpenSSL M to version L. You apply, you make a pull request, you apply it to master. And you go to the ABI branch and you apply, and you cherry pick this change on top of the ABI branch. What this will do is that here we have master. Here we have the ABI branch, which are merged into one uh, channel that the user will receive. But they're basically identical because you, well, uh, I mean, you cherry pick. So, not exactly. You have the latest master which compiled, which had, which still has the M version of OpenSSL. You have the ABI branch, which has only the fixes since, uh, since the last master which compiled. So here you have basically the same version with the fixes. So what happens here, if you have a fix point of next packages here, you will basically do the same compilation except for the one which have fixes because they will have a different derivation. So you will get a different result than the fix point. So either I will see, oh, there is a new derivation that I don't know about because it's not in the, sta in the stable channel, and you will recompile this one. So will there be many changes uh, if we update, update OpenSSL? So yes, there will be many changes here. But what Hydra do stops here. So as a user, you will repatch every package which depends on OpenSSL in your build, but Hydra only recompiles OpenSSL once and does not recompile any of the dependencies after. Uh, when you say it doesn't recompile any of the dependencies, you mean the reverse dependencies? I mean uh, it's Python. Not going, it's not going to rebuild anything that depends on OpenSSL. Yes, it yeah, does exactly. not recompile anything which depends on OpenSSL, right. yes. Okay, and, and then what is the output? Uh, is it going to be a, a, basically a hash rewriting thing? or what? The output of the patching yeah. phase? Yes, that's the uh, same as the replace dep uh, dependencies. Which is rewriting the old ash with the new ash. And in what kind of format? I mean, ultimately, a, a channel needs to come out of this, uh, and, and what will that look like? So currently, I think this is still up to discussion. The way I made it in the in the branch that I have is basically having a quick fix uh, folder, which is just a mirror of the ABI branch. Uh, okay, I, I think I understand now. So you 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 call the ABI Nix packages uh, and you, uh, you you pass it uh, the master Nix packages, uh, so it uses every, or, or is it the other way around? It's the other way around, right? Uh, uh, so uh, in terms of flow, the the current stable one pass into the ABI fixes, which will give you the same one if you have no changes, and give you uh, the fixes if you have a new ABI fixes. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not. Maybe. Maybe I just asked my question whether I understood it right. So, in the brown box. Uh, it's compiled in a way that all dependencies are just compiled through. So if you would change, the problem now is that if you would change something down somewhere down in the graph, it would r trigger a recompilation of everything which depends on it. And this is what you try to avoid. So what you do instead is, is you say, you have a change, and now normally in the normal build process, everything that depends on it would have to be rebuilt. And now you say you have the additional information that the ABI is compatible, and then you stop this recompilation process of the whole tree. And then just take this and overlay this new thing that you stop by knowing that the ABI is compatible with the old version, and this is how you fix it. Do I get this right? So I don't stop. I just do it once. Well, yes, but you stop in terms of you don't recompile all the dependencies that you normally would compile in uh, building the fixed point in the brown box. Yes. 
So, so it comes down to the information that you have to give the system that the ABI is compatible for this particular change. Which is the developer responsibility. Exactly. And so, so to apply this kind of mechanism, what we need is a way to actually put this information into the system so that the system knows, all right, this is something where I can have an early stop because the ABI is compatible And so I can just overlay this with the, on, onto the current branch or the current tree that has been compiled. And um, No, because what you're suggesting, by, at least from what I understand, what you're suggesting by overlay is to move the changes here. No, build a fixed point uh, in the end. Not move the change on it, but have a... Uh, how to say? Um, you have the brown thing, which is a fully... Uh, a, a, where the fixed point has been fully compiled um, and every dependency is, is, is compiled. And in the other one, um, you, if you would make a change, normally the dependency um, would propagate by the derivation that you build and not by the API. So to stop the, uh, the rebuilding of all the dependencies, you say, I have this in additional information that the uh, API is compatible. I, I don't stop. How do we make it faster then? I don't start dependencies. NIST packages is one big function which takes itself as an input. Right. So these functions are like, hey, I have one package which depends on the input of NIST packages, and for each attribute as one function which we applied once. The fixed point is here to make sure that you, do, you go through all the inputs uh, deeply at multiple levels. By just applying it once, You just do one extra step. So if this is, if this is a function. So maybe another way to explain it. So in, in all packages.nix, the way we pass dependencies uh, is not by passing, for instance, open SSL, but by passing packages.openSSL. And packages.openSSL in this case uh, would refer to the old Open SSL. So everything that depends on Open SSL would still be referring to the old Open SSL. So it wouldn't get recompiled. It's only Open SSL itself uh, that would be recompiled. So, so it, if if you look at this as a function, I'm just doing f plus one. I'm just calling it n time plus one. Yeah. And we're just compiling OpenSSL, but not any of its dependencies, because all its dependencies are seeing the old version from the stable branch, while OpenSSL is still seeing the old version, but we have a different uh, derivation for it. Uh, uh, maybe someone. <laughs> we can uh, continue this discussion after if you want. So, um, <laughs> uh, well, I just try it again. So, if this is a method to make things faster, why don't you use it as a default? That's what I'm suggesting. Ah, okay, so I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's asking why don't we always do this? Exactly, yeah. Any, uh, oh! But that's, I mean, my program would be just much faster. Never had to buy any solution. So, <laughs> doesn't work for static builds, but that, basically that's. What Hydra is doing, except that Hydra doesn't go beyond the project that it already has compiled. But that's another detail. <laughs> okay, I've got a remark I would question if this is really a sound approach to doing security updates. Uh, because uh, the first thing is um, not all security patches are necessarily binary compatible. And second, we still have the problem with statically linked in stuff. So wouldn't it, in contrast, not be better to somehow speed the whole process up so that we can just get a soundly recompiled whole new tree? So, as I mentioned, static binaries, yes. Uh, static compilation is not addressed by this solution. I agree. We will have to address it in probably a different way, which might rely on that to make sure that we only recompile the one which depends statically on other programs. 
So then updates which are not binary compatible complain to the one who made the package. <laughs> I can't fix all the problems. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, for, for the, we don't have many statically compiled um, things, and, and we, we want to avoid that. Um, so, but uh, it's... Yeah. So my question is, um, so the patching would happen on the user machine, right? So the patching will happen on the user machine, yes. Right. And it's a, from what I've heard from uh, the Gates guys, uh, it's a matter of minutes. All right. Uh, less than 10, from what they told me. So basically every time the security channel is updated on, you know, no, every time the master branch finishes with the whole rebuild, the security um, branch will, will reset because you don't need a fast branch anymore because you have the binaries. Yes. So this will always reset and we just cherry pick in the, the updates and we, we pull both channels down, we apply the differences and, so, and that, that's how it works, right? Yes, that, okay. uh, except that I was thinking uh, instead of pulling both channels, we pull the two branches into one channel, where you have a quick fix directory which corresponds to the ABI fixes. Okay. Yeah, so okay. Th that's, that's about the same idea. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. As a note, the problem with static uh, linking is more than just linking in a static library. It's also when a package takes a, like the actual source code for a Zlib or whatever includes it with them. So. The solution to that one is actually doing a scan, like a binary scan for signatures of the vulnerable functions. So, yeah, so that's the problems that we have in Firefox, for example. And one of the example I have in mind is, for example, the Zlib. We include the Zlib inside Firefox, and we, uh, one, I can't remember when exactly, we had a, there were a security issue in Zlib, and, uh, some of the developer look, okay, what is the patch? What does it affect? And that's the responsibility of the person who are uh, embedding these packages directly in, this, in their source code to make sure that they also update when there is an issue in the packages that they embed. So in the case that I'm thinking about, we didn't make a security update for uh, Firefox because we were not affected by the Zilli problem. So that's no longer Oracle. Except if we do recompile Firefox with an external Zlib instead of the one which is inside their tree. Um, as a maintainer, how do I keep up with the security updates? Uh, Follow the mailing list. <laughs> so, if I'm a maintainer on uh, next packages, is it my responsibility to do that, or can I get notified if one of my packages is? If you're good? following the mailing list, then you're probably going to be notified. Uh, otherwise, I hope a few people will keep looking at the CVE and others to make sure that hey, <laughs> ping, ping's the right person, or for, uh, or gives a patch for a bash or open SSL or whatever uh, to make sure that it is applied. Even if you're a maintainer, you're pro you might be in vacation or something else. I don't know. That's something that we have to discuss as a community. Uh, what is the responsibility of who? All right. I was just going to say, we've also got the Nixos packages monitor, which is, I think, monitor.nixos.org, which goes through the CVEs and tries to compare them against packages we have in Nix packages. So you could at least look at that and then see if you're a maintainer for anything that has known CVEs. Can I get an email? Or no? <laughs> <laughs> so somebody moni mentioned monitor.nixos.org to give an answer to that. Okay, so if there are any other questions, Nicholas is still around, right, for the Marine of the Conference? Yes. So thank you very much for the presentation.